Hi again, this is Andy, K4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper and Lesson 14 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam course. In this lesson, we go over the G3C questions. The G3C questions go over ionospheric layers, critical angle and frequency, HF scatter, and near vertical incident sky waves. Which of the following ionospheric layers is closest to the surface of the Earth? Well, the, the layer that you need to be concerned about that's closest to the surface of the Earth is the D layer. And from lowest elevation to highest elevation, it goes D, E, and then the F region, which is F1 and F2. So for this question, the layer that's closest to the Earth is the D layer. When can the F2 region be expected to reach its maximum height at your location? Well, it can it's expected to reach its maximum height at noon during the summer. So remember the things that affect the ionosphere as far as ionization. The sun ionizes the F2 layer. So as the F2 layer increases its ionization level, it gains altitude. So the sun's intensity is highest at noon during the summer, so it makes sense that the F2 layer would achieve its highest altitude at that point. So noon during the summer is when you would expect the F2 region to be at its maximum height. Why is the F2 region mainly responsible for the longest distance radio wave propagation? The F2 region is responsible for the long wave radio propagation because it is the highest ionospheric region. And you've got to kind of imagine distance and angles in this one. So if picture in your mind's eye that you're standing 10 feet away from a wall and you're facing the wall. Now take a 45 degree turn to the left, so you're facing the wall at an angle now. Take a ball and throw it at the wall at that angle you'll see where the ball reflects and bounces off and where it stops. Now if you stand 40 feet away from that same wall and throw a ball at the same angle, that ball is going to travel much farther than the first ball. So if your signal is the ball and the F2 layer is the wall, the distance from where you're sending your signal to where the signal is going or the height of the F2 region has a direct relation on how far your, distance, how far your signal will travel. What does the term critical angle mean as used in radio wave propagation? Well, critical angle is the highest takeoff angle that will return a radio wave to Earth under specific ionospheric conditions. So the, critic an the critical angle will vary based on ionospheric conditions, such as time of day, sunspots, and things, other things that affect the ionosphere. So if you've got a lot of sunspot activity, you might be able to get away with a higher critical angle. So what you're looking for is the highest takeoff angle for critical angle, not the lowest. So you're, you're more worried about bouncing at a higher angle than you are at a lower angle for critical angle. Why is long distance communication on 40, 60, 80, and 160 meter bands more difficult during the day? Well, the reason is the D layer absorbs these frequencies during the daylight hours. So remember D equals daylight. The D layer exists during daylight hours. So for, for frequencies below 10 megahertz, the D layer will absorb it all. So luckily the D layer disappears at night when the sun goes down, which allows propagation to pick up in the lower bands. So the, day, the D layer will absorb 40, 60, 80, and 160 meter band frequencies during the daylight hours. What is a characteristic of HF scatter signals? Well, one characteristic is, is they have a wavering sound. And scatter is scatters caused by irregularities in the ionosphere, it's like dust, turbulence, winds, whatever. And it's usually in the D layer. So there's a great deal of loss in the signal, and the irregularity causes the received signal to have a wavering sound. So one of the char characteristics of HF scatter is it has a wavering sound. What makes HF scatter signals often sound distorted? The answer they're looking for in the exam is energy is scattered into the skip zone through several radio wave paths. So it's pretty much the same idea as the previous question. The signal gets bounced around by multiple irregularities at different distances in the ionosphere and causes the receiver to pick up the same signal at different times. Thus, you get kind of a wavering sound. Why are HF scatter signals in the skip zone usually weak? Well, the reason is only a part of the signal energy is scattered into the skip zone. So, once again, it's the same idea as the previous question. Not all the signal gets bounced back, so it loses a lot of energy and it becomes weaker. What type of radio wave propagation allows a signal to be detected at a distance too far for ground wave propagation, but too near for normal sky wave propagation? Well, the answer is scatter, and this is one of the last scatter questions we're going to get. If One way to think about it is, and this is more to, so you could tell what kind of propagation you're getting when you're receiving. So if, if ground wave is short distance and sky wave is long distance, then scatter is medium. 
So if you're a little bit too far away for a ground wave contact and you're a little bit too close for a sky wave contact and the sound is sort of weak and wavery, then it's probably scatter. So, and also you really can't communicate reliably with scatter. It's it, like we said, it's weak and wavery. So if you're in a kind of a medium distance, the answer is probably scatter. Which of the following might be an indication that signals heard on the HF bands are being received via scatter propagation? The answer they're looking for is the signal is heard on a frequency above the maximum usable frequency. So it, basically if the signal has been, if you're listening to a signal and you know that the maximum usable frequency is a little bit below it and you're getting it and it's a little bit too far for ground wave propagation, it's probably coming via scatter. So with scatter, signals can bypass some of the limitations of normal sky wave propagation. And escape might be a better way of putting it, but if you're hearing things is a little bit too far for ground wave, not quite far enough for sky wave, and you're, it's above the maximum usable frequency, it's probably scatter. Which of the following is true about ionospheric absorption near the maximum usable frequency, or MUF? Absorption is minimum. So the closer you get to the MUF, the less your signal will be absorbed by the ionosphere. For ionospheric propagation, absorption is bad. So the closer you are to the MUF, the least amount of your signal is going to get absorbed and the more is going to get reflected back. So when you're trying to get long distance signals, you want to broadcast as close to the maximum usable frequency as you can. Which ionospheric layer is the most absorbent of long skip signals during daylight hours on frequencies below 10 megahertz? Well, here, this one again, it's the D layer. So the D layer will limit signals below 10 megahertz to ground wave propagation during the day. So don't expect any DX on 30 or 160 meters during the day. It's at night, that's when the D layer goes away, and that's when those lower frequency bands really open up. So during daylight hours, for frequencies below 10 megahertz, the D layer will absorb most of those, those signals. What is near vertical incident sky wave propagation? Well, what it is is short distance HF propagation using high elevation angles. So if you can get your antenna to radiate its signal at a high angle, you can communicate on HF with stations closer than the usual skip zone. So by doing this, and this is kind of going back to that wall image we have, if you cut that angle down real steep, you're probably going to get a bounce that's closer to you than normal skywave propagation. So by doing so, you essentially cut the reflected angle of the signal down so your signal is received by closer stations. So short distance HF propagation using high elevation angles is near ver vertical incident skywave propagation. Which of the following antennas will be most effective for skip communications on 40 meters during the day? The answer they're looking for is a horizontal dipole placed between 1 8th and 1 quarter wavelength above the ground. And this is one of those tough questions that's a little deep. Now, 40 meter skip during the day is generally very poor. And a better way to ask the question is which one of these antennas would basically be least bad. Now, what the question is assuming you know is that the lower a dipole is of the ground, the more vertical the angle the signal is radiated. So it can be argued that this means less loss and you can be able to make, get medium range skip contacts. So the answer they're looking for for an antenna that works best on 40 meters during the day of the options, it's a horizontal dipole placed between 1 8 and 1 quarter wavelength above the ground. And that's the end of the G3C review and part one of lesson 14. If you have trouble finding part two, go to hamwhisper.com. You can find the link to the, the post under the ham courses page. And so take a break and I will see you in part two.